Okay. Now we now we see who the stalwarts are, right? Because <laughs> you've been to your Christmas service. Some of you have been to both of the Christmas uh, uh, observances, and yet you're here on, on Sunday morning the next day. Thank you for doing that. Good to have you here today. Uh, we're going to start out singing with Oh Little Town of Bethlehem. It's number 139 in the front of the hymnal, or excuse me, in the midst of the hymnal. Number 139, Oh Little Town of Bethlehem. I'm lost. <laughs> studying this morning 2nd Peter. 2nd Peter and we're in the middle of chapter 1 and we see Peter transitioning in his teaching here. He's been talking as we have as well about qualities of God's people. That's in verses 3 through 11 I think it is. <coughs> And then he goes on to talk about writing and recording this sort of thing for his readers. This is in verses 12 to 14. And then from that, he goes on to talk about reading the Holy Scriptures. And that runs from verse 15 to the end of the chapter, which I think is verse 21. We are in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. You, th you, th you thought that was me falling over, huh? <laughs> no, it's a 1. <laughs> So last time we looked at the qualities and how they related to one another, the qualities in a Christian life, how they related. And uh, today we're going to start around verse 12, talking about uh, Peter's writing about his own life. And he wants to record these qualities for God's people so that they learn about them. But then he writes about also what he's experiencing. 
And then finally we go on to the reading of the scriptures there. So let's have somebody read for us. Um, uh, verse, let's start at verse 11 to just pick up the context. Verses 11 through 15, if someone would read for us. So he's, he's talking about these qualities that he's listed out in uh, the previous verses and how he needs to make these things known and understood to the congregation, that they need to have these in front of them all the time. And this is a part of the reason he's writing. Okay, He needs to get these things recorded because he knows there's something more coming. Um, let's see, verse 12. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, these things, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he and others perhaps have been involved in teaching the congregation. They are well instructed in the things of God. And yet, no matter how well instructed we are in the things of God, when things go haywire in our lives, and they will, <laughs> we find that we need further instruction and guidance in this life. And so he's preparing them for all of this, making sure these things are recorded for them. What does for, he mean by the present truth? I mean, I don't know how the ESV puts it. Mm. King James says the present truth. Yeah, the truth that you have is how they translate it. It's the idea that You've already learned these things, and he's in the process of reinforcing them for them. Okay? So I could say, I could say to, to Mike, you've been through the catechism. Mm -hmm. who, who did you go through with, Mike? Uh, I started out, well, it was with Pastor uh, Sartorius because I went through adult instruction. Okay, you went through with Pastor Sartorius. So he established those truths in your heart and in your life. And now I've got the task, and Pastor Stoltzenberg has had the task, of making sure that you're, you're standing in them, that they're present in your mind and in your life, okay? That you have those truths always with you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Luther says we never outgrow the catechism. Yeah. We always need to come back to those basics, he says. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good. So, um, let's see, verse 13. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder. Okay? As long as I am in this body. And, and does anybody have a different translation for the word body in their text? Tabernacle. 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 Yeah, so... So St. Paul does this as well. It's literally, it's literally the word for tent or tabernacle. But the ESV folks have chosen to use the word body. How is the body like a tent or tabernacle? You always look at the as tabernacle as being a holy place. A holy place? Okay. Our body could be a holy place. Mm. Yeah, our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, St. Paul tells us in some of his writings. Other thoughts? How can a, a body be like a tent or tabernacle? It's always where you live. 
Okay, it, it, it's homey, isn't it, right? This is where our spirit or soul, the immaterial aspect of what it is to be human, this is where it dwells. It dwells in the body. That's how God made us to be. Other thoughts? It's like, like on, that, on that note, it's like a storage. It's like where everything is kept. Okay. The body holds it all together. I mean, everything within, you find within the body. Okay. Yeah. Our body has a good and holy, blessed purpose from God, doesn't it? The Greeks thought of the body as, as evil, as distracting and, and diminishing the soul. And the soul was kind of trapped in the body, as the Greeks described it. But that's not what we see in the Bible. In the, in the Bible. <laughs> in the Bible. <laughs> that's not what we find in the Bible. Okay? The Bible has a much more positive view of the human body and that it's created good by God and for good purpose. And so it doesn't tear down the body. St. Paul uses the word flesh, and some think that that's, he's leaning toward the Greeks there, but he's using flesh in the sense of a sinful longing or desire. That's the sense that he uses that in. So, uh, so the body is good and holy and blessed. How many of you live in a tent? <laughs> there are days. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you live in a tent right now? It's cold. So, so in the summertime, Diane, you'll put a tent up and you'll live in it. No. Does it? Okay. <laughs> it's missing a few things. When do people use tents typically? Camping, okay, for travel, for travel. So how is the body like a tent, thinking spiritually here? Where, we're, where we are residing until we get to heaven. In other words, it's temporary, right? This is a temporary dwelling that we're living in. And God has something better for us. When you see that word tent or tabernacle, think of the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness, right? <laughs> and they did this for 40 years. Anybody here want to live in a tent for 40 years? No. <laughs> okay. And the writer to the Hebrews talks about this. He talks about how they were longing. They were longing for a, a more permanent dwelling. Okay? When Israel finally gets all nicely settled in the promised land, David starts looking at his own house and he starts thinking, wait a minute. The Ark of the Covenant, the, 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 uh, the uh, representation of God's presence in Israel is in a tent. And I have this nice house. And David starts thinking, this isn't right. <laughs> I need to build something more permanent, more lasting. Okay? So this is, this is the thinking behind what Peter is saying here. He's regarding his body as good and holy. It's blessed. It's a gift of God, something to be rejoiced in and celebrated. And yet it is temporary. And like a tent, it starts to get holes in it, and the water starts getting in. <laughs> you ever been camping in a heavy rainstorm? Oh, my word. <laughs> oh, my word. That's, that's its own experience. I put up a tent. Talk about a heavy rainstorm. Yeah. Took the kids up with me. We went to see uh, the Passion Play at Cambridge. We got back, and a, and a storm <clears throat> like a mini tornado blew up. Mm. Blew the props off the stage. They all ran for cover. Got back to the campground. Nobody was gone. Everybody was gone. Everybody left. But our tent. Mm. <laughs> and we had a little cuddle. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good tent, yes. Yeah, and you, you, you staked it down well. <laughs> wow. I couldn't sleep. We just had a little cuddle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so Peter's saying this in part because he knows his time is drawing to a close. His time here in this life is drawing to a close. 
Uh, and he and he feels like he needs to get the things in this letter. This is his last words, so to speak, his last will and testament, we might say. In fact, there's a whole body of literature like that in these ancient times. Peter feels I've got to get this out to my people before I go home to the Lord. Jim, you were talking. When I, when I think of the tent, I always had tent revivals. Okay. And so I don't know whether that you relate to that or not. Hmm. Um, that's a modern tradition to, to have that. Uh, and they usually set that up because they're expecting too big a crowd for the, the church building they have. That's, that's how they usually do that. I just didn't know if it was related to uh, hit some of the mm. Yeah. Uh, I don't think directly. I don't think it would relate di directly. It's more this idea of a temporary structure. Yeah, St. Paul writes this way in, I think it's 2 Corinthians, I want to say chapter 6. He refers to his, it, the, his body as a tent, and it's wearing away, and he's, he's looking forward to the heavenly dwellings. Wearing out. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody knows what I'm talking about when I say wearing out your tent, right? <laughs> yes. All right, so that's... That's what he's doing here. So he says he wants to stir you up by way of reminder so that ongoing edification for God's people. That's, and that's why we're gathered this morning, isn't it? Verse 14. Since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. As our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. When did Jesus tell Peter that he was going to lose his tent? Would it be the garden? He said he would deny him three times? Mm. No, no, that's, that's a different thing. In the end of the Gospel of John, Peter and Jesus are walking and talking and Peter asks him about the Apostle John and whether he is going to stick around or what he's, what he's going to do with his ministry and Jesus tells him not to worry about that and then Jesus tells him that when you are old they're going to take you away <laughs> And essentially tells him that he's going to die. Let's go there. Let's go there. It's the end of the Gospel of John. Let's look at that. Because y'all y'all are looking at me like, really? <laughs> okay. If you say so, Pastor, let's look at it. End of Gospel of John. If you've got a marker, keep Second Peter, because we'll come back at it. Yeah, it's, it's chapter 21. Chapter 21, um, verse 18, verses 18 and 19. If someone would read that for us. John 21, verses 18 and 19. In verse 19. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto them, Follow me. Mm. So here Jesus is prophesying to Peter and telling him, you, to, to give a little context, you know that the early Christians believed Jesus was coming back and that he could come back at any time. They trusted that. And we also believe this and, and look for it and pray for it. Um, but Peter has here a word from the Lord that before he comes back, as he does at that last day, Peter's going to die. He's going to die. 
And, uh, and he, this is what he's writing about in the epistle. He knows this is coming. He knows this is coming. Um, does anybody know from the historians how Peter died? What happened to Peter? Did I see a hand or no? Crucified upside down is correct. Yeah, the, the tradition is that, uh, that the Romans were going to crucify Peter. Does anybody know where he was crucified? Rome. Crucified in Rome. And he, he may be, this may be just before this happens. Uh, but the early historians tell us that, that he was, uh, that they had sentenced him to crucifixion. And they're doing this to mock him, of course, as a Christian leader. And, uh, and Peter requests that they crucify him upside down because he's not worthy to die in the same manner of his Lord. That's, that's the history, uh, what the historians tell us. It's not recorded in the Bible, but it's very early accounts tell us this about Peter's death. You had your hand up, Mike. Now, you know, to your knowledge, is he the only one that died in such fashion mm. Yeah, the, the Romans crucified a lot of people. Yeah. Upside down. I think he's the only one among the, the saints that we remember uh, being crucified that way. I think that's right. But I, I'd, I'd have to research it uh, to know for sure. But uh, that's, that's the story uh, of what happens to Peter. Um, how that all worked, I don't know. How, how did they affix him to the cross? Um, I don't, you know, it's hard to understand. But uh, that's what the historians tell us. So this is, this is before all of this happens, that Peter is writing this letter. And, and it puts it in a different light, doesn't it? When you know that he knows he's going to die. <laughs> He knows this is, he's going to be taken away and killed. That's what Jesus prophesies. And, you know, the Romans, he knows the Romans aren't gentle. <laughs> They're not going to, you know, make it easy. And so these are the words that he wants to leave with his readers, his congregations, before he goes. So have that in mind as you're, as you're studying this and reading it together this morning. Um, any other questions or comments about any of this, about Peter's departure and how it all happens? Go ahead and jump back then to 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 15, And I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. And that's the letter, isn't it? That's what the letter does. He's putting it down in writing what God is uh, urging him to share with the congregation. Let's have somebody now read verses 16 through 18. 16 through 18. He's going to tell us a story or allude to a story. Thank you, Joyce. What story is Peter referring to here? Jesus' baptism. Not Jesus' baptism. That's a good guess because he, uh, he says that he hears the voice of the Father and he says, this is my beloved Son um, uh, with whom I am well pleased. But uh, um, that, that's, uh, Jesus, the Father speaks at Jesus' baptism. But there's another event that's like this. Where, according to Peter, where is this located? 
on a mountain. The Mount of Transfiguration. Okay, so he's referring to that event. You remember the story. Uh, Jesus goes up on a mountain to pray. He takes three of his apostles with him, and they are the closest apostles. They're the ones that are always by Jesus' side uh, when something special is happening. Peter and James and John, okay? He takes them up the mountain, and who, who appears beside uh, Jesus? Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah. So, so two of the most significant prophets of the Old Covenant appear. Do you remember what they're talking about with Jesus? Luke says they're talking about his exodus. His exodus. In other words, his crucifixion and resurrection and ascension. What's going to happen in Jerusalem. That's what they're talking about. And as that conversation's coming to a close, the disciples who are kind of laying around waiting for Jesus, come on, Jesus, right? <laughs> uh, they hear this, the, a cloud descends, and they hear this voice of the heavenly Father, okay, speaking. And this is what Peter is recalling. As, as he's about to depart this earthly life, he remembers this experience of being in God's nearer presence, seeing that glorious appearance of Jesus. Jesus lights up like a Christmas light, okay? Not red, but more like this maybe, more like this white one. He lights up. And this is apparently forever burned into Peter's memory. If you could imagine, right? Got a bunch of guys here in the room. I'll ask you this. You remember how radiant your wife looked when she came down the aisle? That's a memory you don't forget, isn't it? Now imagine if she lit up. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Honey, I didn't know you did that, right? <laughs> And this is what Peter experiences with James and John on that mountain. The radiant appearance of Jesus. It's a, it's a, it's a, a foretaste, we might say, of that splendor of heaven. And this is what's on Peter's mind as he's looking at his old tent and thinking about what's going to happen. He's remembering that splendor of God. It's like life flashing before your eyes, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's reminiscing for sure. He's reaching back to those earlier experiences with Jesus. Let's walk through it now a little bit. Verse 16, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is uh, one of the things that critics would uh, accuse the Christians of. Oh, you're making this stuff up. Peter, you on a mountain and Jesus lit up like a light bulb? Oh, come on, right? <laughs> Who's going to believe that? The people who were there, okay? Uh, I've got over in my office a two-volume collection of cleverly devised myths. <laughs> These are uh, early Jewish and Christian writings, and they take a lot of liberty in describing things and telling stories, and uh, it's basically early Jewish and Christian fiction is what it is, okay? Uh, and this was popular reading uh, back in the day. People were interested in this stuff. And so copies of it lingered around, but the church looked all of that stuff over and said, this is not God's word. This is not from God. This is not what the apostles were teaching us. And so those books got set aside. Okay, and didn't get used by the church. Um, today we have lots of Christian fiction out there, right? All kinds of things. I was listening to a comedian the other night talking about Amish romances. <laughs> 
And that's a, that's a thing, right? That's a popular thing, the Christian romance. Lots, lots of folks like to read those. And, and, and there's no harm in it. Unless you would start reading it like you were reading your Bible. That would be a problem. Okay, That's not how we uh, interact with those sorts of things. So he's, he's reminding them we're not following cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And this is why he tells the transfiguration story. We saw this. We saw this with our own eyes. And folks, it's real. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. There's a few different times in the Gospels. Kathy's mentioned one at the baptism of Jesus. There's another recorded in John's Gospel where they're outside of Jerusalem. They're on their way to one of the feasts and, the, and uh, they hear the voice of the Father and the, the, the uh, crowd say, oh, it sounded like thunder. <laughs> but the apostles are like, oh, no. <laughs> that was God speaking to us. Um, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Have any of you ever wished that God would show up like this and tell you something? Have you ever wished that? <laughs> Some of you are shaking your head yes. Yeah, it'd be nice to have things that clear, wouldn't it? Right? It'd be nice in life to have things that clear. And yet, when we read in the scriptures about the Lord or an angel showing up to talk to people, how do the people typically respond? They're afraid. <laughs> it's a fearsome thing. And that kind of an experience would come with real responsibility, wouldn't it? Because you've been bearing the word of God. You know what, Pastor, though? Even though he might not show up in person like this, yeah. many times in my life I've, I've prayed and I've asked for a sign that if a, a job move or you know, whatever I might be facing in life is the right decision. Mm. And one way or another, I feel he gave me many signs and many times. Okay. He keeps coming your way and just falls in your lap. Mm. You know, so he might not show up in person. Yeah. But I do believe he does yeah. show his sign. It all depends on if you listen to being diligent and, and watching. Mm. Have others had this kind of experience where God, you feel like God has guided you in your life in some way? A number of you are raising your hands. You've had this kind of an experience. And, and it's, it's wonderful to have that sense of guidance, that God's hand is on you and guiding you through life. Um, it's more comfort. You feel like, you know, I, yeah. I'm making the right decision. Mm. God doesn't always do this, though, does he? He doesn't always do this. And not always the way you want. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, the, the old joke is never pray for patience. <laughs> right? Because God will send you things that try your patience and teach your patience. <laughs> I, I think, though, there's examples in the scriptures where God's people do pray for patience. And that's, it's okay to do. Sorry, Jim. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't mean to catch you in the middle of your, of your sip of water there. <laughs> Sherry. Okay. And ask for 
directions in making a decision. And then I go ahead and think, okay, my heart feels good about this, but the minute I make the decision, some sort of a barrier comes mm. up that just mm. says, you know, somebody else got it. Mm. You know, or mm. then you have to sit back and say, wow, thank God you put that barrier up because yeah. I would have went ahead and did it. Yeah. I would have made that decision. Mm. And Mm. And that's where the patience comes in. Mm. You have to pray on it and then wait on it. Mm. If you feel like you've got to make a decision, pray that if it's mm. not the right one, God will put up barriers for you. Yeah. And I think he's mindful of that in us. And, and whether we experience a sign or, or something like that or not, in our faith we're saying, God is watching over me. God is going to see me through. He's going to guide me. No matter what my experience, how it goes, I trust that he is with me. And he's watching out for me. I wonder how it was for Jonah when he got on the boat to go the other direction. If he was telling himself, this is where God wants me to go, you know? And then God sends the storm. <laughs> I, I wonder sometimes about Jonah. Go ahead. I was going to say, even though you, know, you might make that wrong decision, thinking mm. you're making the right one. But mm. that's where our faith comes in, that if you do make the wrong decision, in time, God will, God will get you back in track. He'll yeah. get you back in line with him. Yeah. You know? Yeah, he guides where us. Your faith comes in. We see this an example of this in Peter's life. Not the Somebody mentioned the, the denying him three times thing, but a little bit earlier on, uh, Peter has just made this great confession, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew chapter 16. And... Uh, um, then Jesus starts saying, okay, but I'm going to go get crucified. And how does Peter respond? Do you remember? What? Yeah, don't say that. <laughs> don't say that, Jesus. What are you doing? <laughs> don't talk this way. And how does Jesus respond to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. It's as though Peter was speaking for the devil to tempt Jesus. And Jesus puts Peter into his place. So you think about this. Peter, who walked around with Jesus all over Galilee, saw the miracles, heard the teaching, had these kinds of experiences, he could totally still misread what God was up to. So we have to be careful, don't we? We have to be careful. Um, but by prayer and by faith, we can trust that God is guiding us. We can trust that. So just keeping it all in kind of perspective as we go here. Um, where was I? Verse 18, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And then the, he says this, which I think is even more shocking. And we have something more sure. Now think about that for a minute. He's talking about seeing Jesus in his glory on the mountain, hearing the heavenly Father's voice, and then he says, but we have something more sure. <laughs> Whoa! What could be more sure? What could be more sure than that? And then he tells us, the prophetic word. What's he talking about? The Bible. He's talking about, in this case, especially the Old Testament scriptures. The Old Testament scriptures. Does Peter have high regard for the Old Testament scriptures? Oh, my word. <laughs> oh, my word, he does. Pastor Stolzenberg did a great kindness to this congregation by not every year but I think probably every third year preaching from the Old Testament keeping that Old Testament Bible in front of you as a congregation because it is still there's a New Testament now right we thank God for the New Testament but that Old Testament still is God's word for you and me as believers 
And if you don't have a good background in that Old Testament, you will not rightly understand the New Testament and the Christian life. <laughs> he did you a great kindness by doing that. So we'll continue to do that. I preached last year on the Old Testament. I don't do that every year because, because uh, well, you, you might get upset. But <laughs> it's harder to understand, isn't it? The Old Testament can be harder to understand. Culturally, it's more removed from us. And yet we need those roots. And here's, here's Peter's opinion on it, that prophetic word, that more sure prophetic word he calls it to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Sometime after, oh, maybe after a Lenten service, sit in the back pews and wait for Teresa to turn all the lights off so that the only thing glowing in the church is the eternity candle. Candle. It's that red candle that's above the altar. And see how that little candlelight, how strongly it kicks out in that darkness. Peter's talking about this kind of a contrast. And he would have been familiar with this day in and day out, because that's, that's how they read, by, they read by a lamp, didn't they? That's how they lived. But for us, this is, this is a little bit foreign. And he says that Old Testament, it's like that light. In contrast to the darkness, the darkness of all the culture. I was talking earlier about the Greeks, right? And how they were down on the body. And the body was not good. And the body was, was a prison to the soul in all of these kinds of ideas. Folks, that's darkness. That's darkness. And the light is what we read there in Genesis chapter 1, that we are made in the image of God in his likeness, that he created our bodies as part of his world, and he called them very good, and to view the human body and human life in those ways. That's the light, in contrast to the darkness that will fill this world until Jesus returns on that last day. Appreciate your Old Testament. If you haven't had a chance to sit down and read it, dig in. <laughs> Pick out something and start reading. It is the very word of life. Pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now, he says this about the Old Testament. It's this lamp. It's a more sure prophetic word, and yet he's also tell, telling us something even better is coming. Even better is coming. And that is going to be that experience of Christ coming back for his people, being in God's nearer presence for eternity. Okay? It's almost like he's taking us, taking us walking up steps, and this is, this is the goal. This is where we're headed in that blessings and bliss of heaven in terms of revelation. The morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture, that's the Old Testament, comes from someone's own interpretation. In other words, the prophets weren't making this stuff up. It's the Spirit of God at work in them that causes it to be written for our edification. Verse 21, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, so the will starts with God, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So there is, uh, there's Peter's uh, description of the scriptures as they were in his day. The New Testament was still getting written down as he does this. And think about it this way. Think about that Old Testament as the foundation of Christian doctrine and life. The New Testament is built upon that. And then our lives are 
are built upon those. We need that sure foundation of both testaments in order to have that, that uh, Christian life with the qualities that Peter is talking about, that he lists early in the chapter, that these things would be coming forth through us and in us in our lives. So we abide in the Holy Scriptures. Questions or comments about uh, what you're seeing here in his second letter this morning? Anything? Okay. Well, then let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have laid a sure foundation for our lives, that we are not ever committed to living in tents, but to living in Christ. Christ as prophesied in that Old Testament, that Old Covenant. Christ, Christ as revealed to us in the New Testament, in the Gospels, in the Epistles. Christ as he comes again in glory to take us to be with him. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. As we think about our lives this day and the lives to come, O Lord, bring forth in us these qualities that St. Peter writes about. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, folks, for your attention this morning.